we just thank God for the word that he has tonight. I'm telling you, I'm so excited about the word. It's got me so fired up. I've just been praying and, 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 and yes, what would you call it? Prancing and praying and, 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 and just, oh my goodness. I, sometimes I've been running. Uh, I did some jumping. I, it's like I'm in an exercise. It's like, God, this is amazing. So let's dive right into it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to look at 13 verses here. And our message tonight is hold on. Hold on. Somebody needs a word tonight. And I believe the word from the Lord to you tonight is hold on. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and following. Uh, moreover, brethren, so he's talking to us, the church, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate of the same spiritual food and all drank of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So he's talking about uh, the Israelites when they're going through the wilderness, out of Egypt, headed to the promised land. But look at verse 5. He says, But with most of them, God was not well pleased. So now Paul is saying this is something we need to look back and learn from because there was something they were doing that was not pleasing to the Lord. He says, So for most of them... God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples. So he's saying here in the New Testament church, Holy Ghost filled church, he says, we need to look back and look at this as examples. These are examples to us to the intent that we should not. So these are some things that we see they did that we should not follow those examples. We should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and they were destroyed by by the destroyer. Now all of these things happen to them as examples. Come on, say that with me. As examples. We're to look back. This is to be an example to us. So this happened to them as examples and they were written for our, so this is for us, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So he says, all of this has been brought to us, divinely inspired. This was written for us so that uh, it could be an admonition to us to the ends of the age that have come. Look at verse 12. Therefore, do not let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able but with the temptation will also, God will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Here the Apostle Paul is saying, here the Israelites went through some challenges and the way they handled their challenges, it disqualified them. It opened up the pits of hell for the destroyer and serpents to come and destroy them. They missed the mark. They missed the fulfillment of their uh, a calling and they failed to enter into the promises that God had for them because of that. Now God says here in these latter ages, you, I need you to rise up, learn from them to not follow, not copy, not do what they did so that you can move into the fullness of the promises that I have for you. So he's telling us this generation is a generation <clears throat> that we need to learn from because we're a generation that is ushering in the kingdom of God. Now, if you'll remember in this text, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, really emphasizes the word remember, remember, so that we do not just pass this over and, and, and don't learn our lessons from it. 
Remember how God led his people out of bondage, telling them, I've got a land of freedom for you. I mean, there's a story here for all of us. He led them through the water and he led them through the blood out of Egypt. We know the blood of the Passover lamb represented Jesus. He led them through the Red Sea and the water represents baptism. Sounds like our story, right? Through the blood of Jesus and baptism that we are saved and led them with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night represents the presence of God in His Holy Spirit. And this 10-day trip, 10- to 12-day trip, they say you can make this trip. Uh, they were going to the promised land, but we know 40 years later <clears throat> they failed and did not. The Bible says the majority of them were locked into infants, uh, infancy or infanthood. There was an immaturity that they were operating out of. Out of. And uh, so we got some lessons we can learn from wilderness experiences, which is, which is good because we all go through wilderness experiences. We all, thank God, have the blood of Jesus. We can get saved and there's water. We can be baptized as our proclamation and declaration of our faith in Him. And praise God for the Holy Spirit that comes to dwell in us and fill us and empower us. And thank God for the promises of God. They are amazing. But let me tell you what, there's still a devil. There's still a devil. And if you've not had any opposition and you've not had anything come against you and you've not had any challenges or any trials, then you must have stopped living because the devil is real and he comes in to try and discourage and to thwart and to get us off of path, our path. See, the wilderness trip was not intended to defeat them. And the wilderness experience was not intended to kill them. They were supposed to go through the wilderness, but it was not intended to destroy them. It was intended to mature them. As Paul teaches us, he says that as long as we are children, even though we're children of the covenant, children of the inheritance, it's ours by right. As long as we're children, we're no better off than the slave. We're no better off than the one that doesn't have a covenant. We're no better off. Why? Because of immaturity. It takes maturity for the transfer of the responsibility of all that God has provided for us. And the wilderness can be used not as a place to destroy you, but as a place to mature you. And, and, and it failed in their lives. As the Bible says, they were overthrown in the wilderness. They failed to possess the promises of God. They failed to enter into what God has prepared for them. And they died falling short of it. And Paul says we are to look back at that. And we're to learn from that so we don't make the same mistakes. So we can enter into and find fulfillment of the destiny that God has called us to. They refused to mature and believe God for His Word. Rather, they showed immaturity, which God says was uh, manifest through murmuring, through blaming, and through complaining. God oh, repeats that all about their story over and over. They were murmurers. They blamed others. They blamed God. They blamed Moses. They, they were blamers. And, and then they were complainers. And, and it was a sign of a manifest of an immature heart and an immature mind. And the, and the Bible says that they came up out of Egypt with a high hand. And if you look at that interpretation, it could mean they were lifted up with pride. They'd seen what God had done miraculously in bringing them out of Egypt. They had seen some miracles of God on their behalf, and they got pride. Pride came in. Man, the enemy will look to bring pride even in the presence of God himself in heaven as he's got a third of the angels to turn against God and to be cast out with him as the demons of this earth. And if we're not careful, we too, we can get into this sense of pride. You know, we all, if we're saved, we know we've come up out of bondage, right? We've come up out of slavery through the blood of Jesus. We've come through the water of baptism. We've come with the cloud of God's presence of His Holy Spirit. And, and if we're not careful, if we're not careful, the enemy's going to do the same thing he did to the Israelites, and he's going to get us a little puffed up. We're going to think a little better of ourselves than maybe we should. We're going to think that we're more special than everybody else. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you sit here today and you call God the God of your life, then you need to know that, that we need accountability. 
If, if the enemy so tricked the angels in heaven and, and got uh, in heaven a sinless environment and got them to turn against God, don't you know the enemy can trick us? He tricked Adam. He tricked Eve. He can trick us. That's why you need a pastor. That's why we need godly equippers in our life. That's why you need a church. That's why you need a Christian community. That's why you need to understand that, that we don't all know it down here. We don't all know it. We're learning together and we're holding each other accountable. Somebody say amen. I remember when I started preaching and I thought I knew it all, you know. It's amazing. I was like, man, I was just, the Holy Ghost anointed me and I felt like, wow, I never had power like that. And I was preaching on the anointing. And man, I thought, I, with that anointing, I don't need any training. I don't need any more study. I just need anointing, you know. And I had to go through some wildernesses to, in order to mature and uh, in order to die to me and come alive to God and in order to grow up in order to grow up, okay? See, pride turned that archangel into the devil, right? And that same spirit of pride can get a hold of us if we're not careful. Now, the Bible says that Jesus came up out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. In Luke chapter 4, it says Jesus came up out of the wilderness. See, Jesus even went through the wilderness. So don't get to complaining and blaming and murmuring if you're going through a wilderness experience. I'm telling you, if you're going through some tough times, the word of God to you tonight is you need to hold on. You don't need to murmur. You don't need to blame. You don't need to complain. You need to hold on. Because Jesus even went through some, the wilderness, but he came up out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. Now, the Israelites, the Bible says that generation, they, had, they died in the wilderness except for two of them, Joshua and Caleb, Right? Now, you got to see this. The wilderness defeated the Israelites while the wilderness empowered Jesus. Which side of this do you want to be on? Do you want to go through the wilderness? Jesus went through the same wilderness. You go through the wilderness. Do you want to die there and miss out on what God has for you? Or do you want to be empowered and come up out of the wilderness. That's a nugget that you can take hold of tonight, that when you are in the wilderness, one of two things is going to happen to you. It will either defeat you or it will mature you. Now don't complain, don't murmur, and don't blame, because Paul is telling us, look at what the Israelites did. That's recorded as an example to us that we don't do that. We don't want to turn back. We don't want to whine and complain and murmur and blame. We want to press forward, hold on, and go forward into what God has for you. So if you're going through a tough time, don't let it defeat you. Let it mature you. And here's the promise. You will never go through a wilderness experience where you hold on to your faith and patience in what God has said and that you won't come up out of that wilderness experience empowered by the Holy Spirit. For Jesus is our example too. And if we'll do what Jesus did, we'll come up out of this tough time. We'll come up out of this challenge. We'll come up out of this setback empowered by the Spirit of God. God sent me on assignment tonight to talk to somebody. I'm in your business. It is God speaking. He wants you to know. He sees where you're at. He sees the challenge you're going through. He knows it may be a dry time. He knows it may things may not be breaking out the way you want them to break out. But he is saying, he is sending his word, saying, do not murmur, do not complain, do not blame, do not act out of immaturity, but hold on through faith and patience and continue to declare that God is King of kings and Lord of lords and press on and you're going to come up out of this wilderness empowered by the Spirit of God. See, the Bible says when Jesus... See, I want to learn. I, I want to learn what the Israelites did in the wilderness that caused them to miss out so that I don't do that. But then I need a positive example. I want to look at what Jesus did. And I want to do that because he came up out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit, right? What did Jesus do? Well, the Bible says that when Jesus was in the wilderness, here's one thing he did. He made a decision... A worship decision, okay? He told Satan in the wilderness, think now, he's in the wilderness, he's in that tough time, he's in that challenging time, and in the midst of that, he tells the devil, I will worship the Lord my God, and only shall I worship him. He made a worship decision when you didn't feel like it. 
He made a worship decision when everything around him did not come in celebration or chorus with him to worship. When his circumstances were down, he made a decision to look up. When everything was coming against him and pressing him backwards, he made a decision he was going to move forward and he was going to worship his God, his Father, only would he worship him. He made a worship decision. Three things happen when you make a worship decision in the wilderness. These will have to happen for Jesus. It'll happen for you. The devil left him. <laughs> I don't know about the other two, but that one right there is enough. The devil left him. When he said, I am not going to bow, I am not, I will worship the Lord God only, only with him will I worship, the devil left him. When you make a worship decision in the wilderness, I didn't say when everything's going good. I didn't say when the check came through. I didn't say when, when everything is hunkadory in the relationship. I said in the wilderness. When it's hot, when it's dry, when it's hurt, painful, and everything looks like it's going down, he says, I'm not going down. I'm going to stand here and lift up my God. I'm going to worship. I'm going to worship him only. The devil left him. Hallelujah. Some of you are going to kick the devil right out of your life when you make a decision that I'm going to worship God when I feel good, but I'm going to worship God when I feel bad. I'm going to worship God when everybody's clapping praises to me, but I'm going to worship God when people are lying against me, when people are turning against me. I'm still going to worship God. The devil left him. And secondly, angels came and ministered to him. Heaven has angels given charge over you that are ready to, to fly in, move in, however they move. They're ready to move in and minister in the name of God on his behalf of goodness to you when you make a decision to worship God in the wilderness. And then third... He came then out of that wilderness. I, the, the, the exit door opens up and he was able to exit the wilderness, come up out of the wilderness and begin to work miracles. The only miracles that we'd ever seen in Jesus' life. Now they begin as he comes out of, the, out of the wilderness experience. Let me tell you why. It's time for miracles in your life. It's time for miracles in your family's life. It's time for miracles in your body. It's time for miracles in your mind. It's time for miracles in your money. It's time for miracles, I'm telling you, for your, for your children and your children's children. It's time for miracles. God is a miracle-working God. The devil is trying to thwart and hold back every miracle. But if you say, wait a minute, I'm in a wilderness uh, and I'm going to make a, a plan right here, a worship decision, that I'm going to worship God. God it moves in. He, uh, he moves in. Yashab. He moves into the worship. He, you, we're going to see the miracle manifest of God's hand in my life. I'm going to worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hope you see this, that when you get into your wilderness experience, you got to make a worship decision and begin to praise the Lord. Begin to praise the Lord. I know you don't feel like it, but praise Him anyway. I know you may not sound like it, but praise Him anyway. I know it may not look like it, but praise Him anyway. Just begin to lift up the Lord. Lift Him up. Say, my God, you're faithful. My God, you're good. You said there's no shadow of turning with you. You said you would never leave me. You would never forsake me. You said you would be my lily of the valley, my bright and morning star. You said when it's the darkest at night, you're going to break through as my morning star. Hallelujah. You said that when I'm pressed up against the wall, you're going to make a way of escape. I praise you, God. I praise you for the healing of my body. And that body still in a wilderness is hurting, but I thank you for your healing hand. I thank you for your healing time. You may still be broker than dirt, but you say in the midst of it, I thank you that you're meeting all my need according to your riches and glory. I know I don't see it yet. I'm still in the wilderness, but I'm going to praise you for it because you're a God. You're faithful. You're a covenant God. I'm praising you for my children and their salvation. I, I, Lord, I'm not letting them go. I'm not letting the devil have them. It may look like the devil has them right now, and I'm in a wilderness experience, but I know that if I'll make a decision to worship you in the midst of my wilderness that the power of God the angels are going to heaven are going to be moving in the spirit of God the doors are going to open and I'm going to move into the miracle manifest of the favor of God hallelujah hallelujah the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience in the things he suffered can you imagine that 
Now here's Jesus, son of God, but he lays aside his, his sonship. He lays aside being the glory and all that he had in heaven. And, and Philippians 2, 5 through 11 tells us that he came to us. He took on the body of a man uh, uh, that was obedient, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He depended on the Holy Spirit, just like we depend on the Holy Spirit. That's why he said, what you've seen me do, you can do it. You can do it. And even you can do greater things as I go. And the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. So we can, we can do what Jesus did because Jesus showed us how in a human body to depend on the Holy Spirit. So he had to learn obedience. He had to, he had, his flesh felt the same thing your flesh feels. He was touched with every point of temptation, the Bible says, but without sin. He had to be obedient to his father to be qualified to shed sinless blood to pay off our sinful account. So he had to go through the test. He had to go through the wilderness. He had to go. And in Hebrews 5 and 8, it says that, that Jesus learned obedience in the things that he suffered. So as he suffered, it caused him to mature. He was in that wilderness. It caused him to mature. Forty days, uh, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. There was things and challenges that he had. But let me tell you what. He, he was obedient to the Father. He gave us the example that we need to follow. Let me tell you, we are made pliable under pressure. You, it really shows what's really in us when we come under pressure. We are purified through the fire. The Bible uses analogies of, of the ironsmith and how the fire not only purifies us but makes us stronger. How it makes us is gold and, and silver. It makes us more valuable, okay? We're strengthened when we go through the fire. We are purified when we go through the heat. So the wilderness experience, it's not divine judgment. I'm here to help somebody out tonight. This, this wilderness maybe you, that you're going through, it is not divine judgment. It's not meant to be punitive and it's not devised to discourage you or to stop you, but it's not meant to uh, be a place that you got to live the rest of your life. The Israelites were supposed to go through the wilderness. Jesus went through the wilderness. John the Baptist came up out of the wilderness. Paul went and spent three and a half years in the wilderness and then came out of the wilderness. The wilderness experience is nothing more, I like to look at it this way, it's nothing more than the doormat on which we wipe the dirt of Egypt off of our feet, saying goodbye to that filth, goodbye to that pain, goodbye to that sorrow, goodbye to that bondage of Egypt, and now it's the welcome mat that welcomes me into the promised land. That's what it is. So it matures me and, and it lets me see that I do place my faith in God and His Word and His promises. Let me give you an example. I think this is a good one. In Matthew, the latter part of chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 uh, it's the story of when John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus. And, and uh, the Bible says in verse 16 that when John the Baptist baptized him, that the Holy Spirit, like a dove, came on Jesus. Remember? Then verse 17 says, Father God spoke and said, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Isn't that right? So Jesus gets baptized. Dove descends on him like a, the Holy Spirit, like a dove. That's one verse. Verse 17 Father God speaks, my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then you move over into chapter 4. That 17 is the last one of 3. So we move to chapter 4, verse 1. And the devil comes to tempt him. Do you see that? Now what does that say to me? That says to me that you can have a dove experience in one verse. You can have Father God's good pleasure, voice of, voice of good pleasure over you the next verse. And then the very next verse, you're having to deal with a demon. Now, our, our flesh doesn't like that. We like the dove experience. We like Holy Ghost moving and ministering and, and, and just shining forth in a great way. We love hearing Father God's voice spoken favorably over us, right? That's something we run, dance, shout, uh, you know, jump. It, you know, it's just hallelujah. It's awesome. It's goosebumps on top of goosebumps. It's an ex exciting experience. But then the very next verse, you have to deal with the demon. That's the part we don't like. That's the part we don't like. There's only one verse between the dove and the devil. Now, we need to understand that. 
Because when God moves and God's preparing us to move into the next level and things are so exciting that we have a dove and a voice of the Father experience, we should not be surprised the next verse that we have to deal with the devil. We shouldn't say, oh my, this is not right. This is the year of the next level. This is the year of promotion. Why is there a hindrance? Why is there a set? Why is all hell breaking loose? You should be made aware. Paul said, I need to give you these 13 verses to teach you to look at this, to study this, to see how the devil operates when God is moving, how the devil counteracts and how you are supposed to respond. Don't respond like the Israelites did in the wilderness. They missed out. You respond like Jesus did. And you'll come up out of this wilderness empowered by the Spirit. Hallelujah. I mean, we can come to church on Sunday morning and have our dove experience. And by Monday afternoon, we can be facing demons. Anybody, anybody's home? Any, I know I got cameras in all of your home. I don't act like... Don't put no fake halo on there. I know. I know. The Spirit of the Lord's been showing me. I know. See, we are the children of God. And the devil knows that his time is very limited. And he's madder than a wet setting hen, as the old country folks would say. And you and I, we've got to mature. To move into the inheritance and to move into the fullness of what God has, we have to mature. So you've got to learn to take your stand. And you've got to stand every day, not just on Sunday when the music's playing, but you've got to stand on Monday when devils are screaming at you. Do you hear what I'm saying? You've got to realize that your dove experience is not just so you can feel good, and feel good is awesome, and I agree, but it is to empower us so that when the devil does come, you can do what Jesus did. Right? And you and the power of the Holy Spirit can declare like Jesus did to the devil, it is written. You're not getting me off course. It is written. You're not getting me off my path. It is written. I see the promises and I'm moving into the promises. I'm not going to go circle that mountain for 40 years. It is written. I'm staying on task. It is written. Hallelujah. And I'm going to worship my God and Him only will I worship. Now the Bible says that John the Baptist came up out of the wilderness of Judea. Now it tells us exactly which wilderness. And geologists do a study and they tell us that that is the lowest place on earth. Now I don't know if you see this, but the Spirit of the Lord helps me see this that God began His redemptive work for you and me in one of the lowest places here on earth. So when you say, I'm down, He started your redemptive work lower than where you're at. There's no low so low where the redemptive work of Jesus Christ has not already been there and is there available for you. Please listen to me. Some of the greatest work God is doing in the lives of our lives, if we'll think about it, it starts in us when we are at some of the lowest places in our life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And sometimes when we try to help loved ones and we try to, uh, you know, save them through our own strength to keep them from getting to a low place, uh, we are only uh, lengthening and causing a lot more damage than if we let that prodigal find his place eating with the swine earlier so that in that place he can turn and say, wait a minute, I'm going to my father's house. I'm going home. I, I, it's much better. It's much better doing it God's way. I, I, I've, had a, I've had an about, a, about face experience. I've had a, a repented experience. I've had a metamorphosis that's taken place in my mind and, and a metania that I'm going to make a right about turn because I don't like this low place. I want to come up out of this low place as well. So you may say, well, pastor, I'm depressed. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says, that God will pull down the high places and he will fill the low places. And, and a valley is nothing more than a depressed place. So if you're telling me that you're depressed, then you're a prime candidate for the filling of God. 
You say, well, I'm depressed. That means I'm so many miles away from what God wants to do. No, I'm saying you but so many steps away from what God wants to do. It is in that place if you'll turn your attention unto God and get back to what the Word of God says about you and over you and for you and you'll take hold of God. You will see angels usher in. You'll see the devil run as you make God your King of kings and Lord of lords and your worship experience in that place of depression. That praise will usher in the move of God. Hallelujah. See, so many times our high places or our high times with God are followed by low wilderness experiences. You see the ebb and the flow. Here they came up out of Egypt. That was a high time for them. And then they find themselves in the wilderness. Now the wilderness was not meant to be punitive. It was not meant to be judgment. It was meant to be a doormat of which they could mature and wipe the dirt and filth of Egypt off and move mature servants of children of God into the promises of God. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist and immediately he went into the wilderness. John the Baptist was anointed and the Bible says then he went into the wilderness. If you remember Saul of Tarsus who becomes Paul... He goes and spends three and a half years in the wilderness. See, the Israelites prayed and received the promise of, of a land that flowed with milk and honey. God gave that promise, yet when they came through the Red Sea, there was no land that flowed with milk and honey. There was a wilderness. There was not even water there. There was nothing to drink, but God had a plan. He was going to bring them through the wilderness very quickly. That was God's plan. He had miracle water. He had miracle food. He had miracle presence of, of, of heat by night, a fire in the sky, and light illumination, and a cloud to cool them by day, and the presence of God to be manifest in that cloud to guide them so they didn't get lost. But they, in their immaturity, they complained, they murmured, they blamed, and that immaturity kept them there. They forfeited the, all that God had for them because they didn't hold on to the promise of God. They let it go for what they were feeling at the moment. And Paul tells us, and it says, look back at them. These are the things you must not do. You must learn from them and not do these. Do not repeat these. If so, you be too. You will forfeit moving into all that God has for you. But let's look to Jesus and follow his example so we can come up out of this wilderness. Hallelujah. There are a lot of confused saints today who say, well, God told me he was going to do this and he told me he was going to do that, but I've experienced just the opposite. I know some of you probably have said, you know, God said this is a year of increase and this is a year of promotion, but in 2021, I, I've, I, there's been a lot of pruning. There's been a lot of loss. There's been a lot of setback. There's been a lot of challenges. There's been a lot of stubborn, stubborn things that, that just want to stand in the way. There's been mountains that are standing in the way. See, Abraham got a promise from God of having a promised child, but between the promised child and the, uh, the promise of a child and the promised child came a problem child. Right? And here's what I'm saying. Don't give up. Don't give up. You hold on to the promise that God has given you. If God has spoken something into your spirit that He is going to bring past into your life and, and you've stepped out by faith that, uh, and you've received that promise, you said, yes, God, I, I'll receive that promise. And, and now you've been hit with a wilderness experience just opposite of what God said. You need to listen. You need to listen. Take out your spiritual, spiritual Q-tips and clean out your ears for just a second and open those ears and listen to me. You ought to shout as loud as you can because this revelation will allow you to step over this problem into your promise. This revelation that God has been on assignment to give tonight will help you step over that problem into your promise. You, 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 they, you, gotta get, you can't get impatient with God. You can't get impatient with the pace of God. One author wrote, if God has one word, a one word enemy, it's hurry. Said God don't like the word hurry. Okay, I never thought about it. this. Author says if you'll look at the way God He gives promises and then He works miracles and helps them, but none of it entails hurry. We are a microwave generation serving a crockpot God. Okay, so we've got a crockpot God, and we want to throw it in that microwave, right? It was in the wilderness that Israel, think about it, it was in the wilderness that Israel built a habitation for God. 
They didn't have a habitation for God in Egypt. They'd never had a habitation for God. But it was there in the wilderness they got the revelation of how to construct the tabernacle that later became the temple when they got into the promised land. So they were able to build a habitation with God in the wilderness. It was in the wilderness they, they found how to worship God, what God likes and what God does not like. They, 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 it was in the wilderness that they learned to, that that cloud was a, the goodness of God, the grace of God that was giving them the coolness from that hot desert sun. But also that cloud, when it moved, God is not a stagnant God. God is not a dead God, but He's alive. And the cloud would move and they would pack up their stuff and follow the cloud by day. But at night, the wilderness got very cold. And they saw the same gracious God in the day that would cool them from the sun with a pillar of fire, would heat up the skies and, and give them warmth. But also that pillar of fire gave them light because it was dark at night. And then that pillar of fire would move. He found out that God is not a God that just works during the day. God is a God that works even at night. So as the pillar of fire would move, they would pack up and they would go where God would lead them and God was leading them to the promised land. All of that came in the wilderness. They got miracle manna from heaven daily in the wilderness. The Bible called the rock that went followed them, the rock that went with them, with which brought the water to quench the thirst of millions of people and all of their livestock. That rock was Jesus, is what the New Testament tells us. So there they were drinking from the very sweetness of Jesus in the wilderness. It was in the wilderness. Now, microwave says no wilderness. I'm in the place I don't want to be, and I'll take the fast 30 seconds. Beep, beep. And then let me be in my promises. And you're going to miss the maturation. You're going to miss maturing. You're going to miss learning how to make God the center of your worship. You're going to miss how to follow Him and how to know Him and how to receive the miracles from Him. You're going to miss it all if you, if you try to microwave your way through that. Saul of Tarsus, when he had his road to Damascus, uh, radical conversion to Christ... And after that, you know, he went to the temple and Ananias uh, saw him there and prayed and, and his eyesight came back. He went, the Bible says he went into the wilderness three and a half years and talked to no man as he learned how to minister by the Spirit of God. Wow. I remember Moses going and, in the wilderness as well. And there at a burning bush got his call for God. Paul said it was there in the wilderness where Father God revealed the Son in me. That's what Paul said. It was in the wilderness that my heavenly Father revealed the Son, Jesus Christ, not to me, but in me. So let me tell you again, between your Egypt and your promised land is going to be a wilderness that can frustrate you if you don't understand its purpose. In the wilderness, God will devil-proof you if you'll let Him. In your challenges... When things seem to be going the opposite from what God said and you're still going to stand with what God said and not let the circumstances get you into murmuring and complaining and blaming and acting a fool, the, de the God's going to devil-proof you. Hallelujah. You're going, to, you're going to be armored up in a way that's going to help you take others into the promised land. And also in the wilderness, He'll help you build a tabernacle, a, habit, you know, a habitation with God. You can get close to God in these, in these times you're waiting, in these times that the enemy's blowing the wind against you when your sailboat is moving in this direction and it seems like now you're just going and zigzagging until you can catch the wind to help you go in the direction you know you're supposed to go. In that time of zigzagging, you build a habitation with God and say, God, I worship you. I trust you. I love you. I'm not turning my back on you. I don't understand what's going on, but you do. And my hand is in your hand. And my heart belongs to you. And I'm going to worship you. And when the sun's shining, but when it's a rainy day and it's all cloudy, I'm still going to worship you. And when the, blow, the winds of opposition are coming against me, every circumstance that I put, it seems like it comes and falls back on me, I'm going to praise you anyway. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to murmur. I'm not going to blame. I'm not going to turn back. I'm not going to stand down. I'm going to hold on 
to your promises. I guarantee you, you build a habitation with God, you're going to see the Spirit of God bring you up out of the wilderness empowered by Him. So I'm here tonight to encourage you with this. Yes, there is an enemy that works in the wilderness. And he's there waiting to devour every promise you've ever supposed to give birth to. I know that. But God has placed the seed of promise within you. And I believe God is saying tonight, you need to hold on and not give up. You are to hold on and not let go. That you're to hold on and not give in. To weary not in well-doing, for you will reap if you faint not. Hold on. Come on, church. You need to declare it to yourself and over your destiny that I'm not going to let the devil kill my baby. You know, there was a red dragon in, in Revelation chapter 12. The Bible says that the red dragon was uh, waiting uh, for the birth of that child. And when that child would be born, that he would devour him. Now, that's some say the birth of Israel, which he tried to destroy. The birth of Jesus, which he tried to destroy. But I'm here to tell you, the, the enemy may be hovering over and he's waiting to kill, steal, and destroy. But you got to say, uh, wait a minute, my promise came from the Lord. My life is in the Lord's hand. My trust belongs to him. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I can overcome this red dragon by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And the word of my testimony is you're not going to kill my baby. You're not going to kill my dream. You're not going to kill my vision in this wilderness. Uh, God, what God has said he's going to do, he's going to do. God is not a man that he should lie, O oh red dragon. So you just as well pack it up and fly off somewhere else because I'm going to hold on. I'm not going to let go and I'm not going to give in. Even though I'm in a, in a wilderness here, I'm not going to complain like the Israelites did. I'm not going to murmur like the Israelites did. I'm not going to blame someone like the Israelites did. No, no, no. I, it may not be a happy, clappy day for me, but I tell you what, I'm going to clap my hands anyway. I'm going to lift them up and shout to my God anyway. I'm going to say this is the day the Lord has made. I will. I don't feel like it, but I will. It's not something that I really want to do right now, but I will. I will myself. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Job, during the trials of his life, he asked God 181 questions. Did you know that? And God's response, God asked him 184 questions. Huh. God was saying, wait a minute. Let's look who's really in charge here. You need to stop looking and, 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 and parsing everything going on and wondering why, 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 God, why, 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 why? And, and I'm, let me ask you, where were you when I hung out the sun, moon, and the stars? Where were you? I mean, you, 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 you're crying over this, and I understand you, the devil's trying to take you down. But if you just look to me, I'm the one that can bring you up out of this. And, and when Job turned and began to praise God and pray for his friends, then you see he came up out and got restored double. Hallelujah. So don't lose faith and get into doubt and unbelief with a bunch of questions. Just know this. God had his, has his eye on. God has his eye on you. He says he's etched you in the palm of his hand. The Bible says that he even sings over you, dances over you. Know that he will be there. Know that he is faithful. You may not feel him, but say, I don't walk by feelings. I walk by faith. Jeremiah 29, 11, you know that verse very well. One, one translation of it says, I know what I'm doing. God says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. My plans are to take care of you and bring you into peace. That's my plans. My plans are not to abandon you to evil. My plans are give, to give you the future you hope for. That's my plans. That's what God's word is to us tonight. He doesn't have plans to hurt you. He has plans to help you. Not plans to hold you back, but plans to promote you. Your circumstances say the opposite. That's just the wilderness experience. That's just the doormat for you to wipe the filth of the, the old off and go into the new. That's for you to say, that's my welcome mat into the promised land. So you got to hold on to the promise of God and don't let it go. Now let's get back to the Israelites for just a minute before I wrap this thing up. They were promised a land that flowed with milk and honey, right? 
And they came up out of Egypt and, and, and instead of a land that flowed with milk and honey, they come into the wilderness, okay? And they're without water. And after three days, they came first to a well, okay? And the water was bitter, the Bible says. Remember that? And there God told them what to do to turn the bitter water sweet. They were to take a tree, <laughs> something about a tree. He who hangs on a tree, the curse comes off and the blessing comes on. So there's a type. They take a tree and they put it into water and the water turns sweet. Now, I don't know if you see this or not, but in your wilderness experience is there where you learn how to turn the bitter water sweet. You don't do that in the promised land. You learn that in the wilderness, how to get the water that's bitter turned sweet. Please listen to me. There's a great potential to becoming bitter in the wilderness. Man, when things don't go your way, there's a great potential for you to get bitter. Notice how folks say, I'm hurt. They say, I'm hurt because that puts the blame on somebody else. You hurt me, right? Very, very rarely, I've ever, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone say, I'm bitter, which puts the blame on you, right? And God is the master at turning the bitter sweet. Remember Samson? Remember Samson? Man, what a, what a story. A lion came and attacked him. And, and it was one of Samson's greatest battles and his greatest victory. He slew the lion. And later he passed by and he saw the bees on the carcass that the, the lion was laying there. And, and I know this carcass that I've shown you here is not uh, probably a lamb, but it gives you the picture, okay? And uh, he walks by and he sees this carcass of the uh, lion and the bees were there and he found honey in the carcass of the lion. And it was there in Judges 14 and 14 where he gave that riddle. Out of the eater came something to eat and out of the strong came something sweet. And he got something sweet out of something that was so bitter. I believe the very thing that hell has sent to destroy you that God can turn it into something that sustains you. Do you hear what I'm saying? Not that what the devil sent to destroy you is just going to get moved out of the way. No, what the enemy meant for evil is going to get turned and it's going to actually be used to sustain you. The very thing that the enemy wants you to get bitter over, God is going to bring something sweet out of it. There's a prophetic word for somebody right there. And it's going to strengthen you and it's going to help you come up out of the wilderness. Hallelujah. So going back to 1 Corinthians at verse 10... When they started complaining, the Bible says that it, uh, a destroyer was released. He said, I want you to learn from this. Remember we read that? Learn from what they did. They complained and a destroyer was released to destroy them. Learn from that. Which means when you start complaining, you release the destroyer in your life. You're opening the door for the destroyer to come in. God said, I want you to learn from this. That was in verse 10, I think it was, this last verse. And where they destroyed by serpents, nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Remember he said, now these are the things uh, that we should not do. He said, learn from them. Don't do that. How many times have we given access to the, to the destroyer? Demonic spirits of destruction. We've welcomed them into our circumstance. We've welcomed them into our body. We've welcomed them into our family. We've welcomed them into our place of business because we began to complain and murmur. Anytime you have a vision or a dream or a promise from God, there's three things that's going to happen to that vision. There's the birth of that vision, which is exciting. This is the vision. God has said it. There's the birth of it. But then there must come the death of that vision. This is where so many quit in a wilderness experience because they think this wilderness experience is forever. God said, I've got the promise, the vision. I'm getting you there. I need to mature you. I need you to learn habitation. I need you to learn how to build an altar of worship and praise me in the midst of your challenge. I need you to mature. I need you not to become bitter, but out of the bitterness things of life that you're going to turn it to sweet. I need you to learn these things and I, and so I can bring you through. So there has to be a death of that vision, but then there's always the resurrection of that vision. 
God gave the vision that he was sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And there was the birth of that vision. But then we saw that the enemy said, I'm going to try and take him out. And there came a wilderness experience that Jesus had to go to, even to the point that he physically died. But we know on the third day that the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, brought him up out of the tomb, resurrected alive, and the vision of salvation is available to each and every one of us fulfilled. That promise is ours tonight because of the birth, death, and resurrection. You got to hold on. You never go from the birth of the vision to the blessing of the vision. You go from the birth of it to the death of it to the resurrection of it. Let me tell you today, just as sure as you have a vision from God and, 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 and you're ready to give birth to it, the devil's going to try everything and make it look like it dies. Just die to it. Say, God, if it's you, it's you. I'm here. I'm holding on. Man, I remember opening the doors of this church and God said, don't lock the doors ever again. Don't you chain them again. And I remember there were times I'm like, God... What I'm going through and seeing and experiencing in, in those early years, this ain't, this ain't fun. This ain't something nobody needs to go through. But I'm going to hold, I had to learn. It didn't, I, I'm not saying I did it perfectly, but I found when I was at my breaking point, I went back to God and I said, God, this is what you told me to do. This is the promise. Everything's going the opposite, but I'm believing you. I see it's going to be an international ministry. I see it's going to be reaching around the world. I see missions and I see orphans and I see widows and I see salvation and I see souls being empowered and people being healed, people being saved and people being delivered and people walking in the fullness of the spirit. And, and I just held on. And I said, God, help me, help me. And, and I, I feel weak, but I'm going to hold on. I'm going to hold on. And then a resurrection power of God comes. The Holy Ghost comes. And he keeps taking it from level to level. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In that wilderness, in that challenge, build a habitation for God in you, in your wilderness experience, and learn to hold on. And just as you see the sun break through that eastern sky, the next morning you're going to see the anointing of God resurrect the promise with the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit and you're going to see that promise come to pass. Just don't murmur. Don't complain. Don't blame. That kept the Israelites in unbelief and kept them in the wilderness for 40 years. A 10 to 12 day hike turned into 40 years and them dying short of going into the promised land. See, murmuring and blaming and complaining is the language of unbelief. Amen. Mature yourself right now. Mature. So it's time for me to grow up. There's things I shouldn't say anymore. There's, things, there's ways I shouldn't act. I pray, I pray you stop sucking a pacifier, you adults in here. I pray that you're not sucking a pacifier or drinking out of a bottle, okay? It's things as you grow up, you stop doing. It's time to grow up spiritually and stop murmuring and blaming and complaining. It's the language of unbelief. It calls God a liar. That's what you're saying. God, you're a liar. Every time you murmur and complain and blame, you know, God, you're a liar. But, but praise is the language of faith. And it calls Satan a liar. Faith is fatal to the devil. I'm telling you. Faith is fatal to the devil. So in the wilderness, you must have two things. Faith and patience. Faith and patience. You know Hebrews 6 and 12, that you do not become sluggish. That word means lazy or, or not focus, lose focus and, and energy to stay on track. But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises you got to have faith and what? Patience. And I know God has given me an assignment to speak to somebody here today that you're in a wilderness. You're between the promise and the fulfillment. And you must have faith and patience. Faith will speak to that mountain and patience will stand there until it moves. Faith will speak to that mountain, but patience will stand there until it moves because you know it's got to move. Because God said, if you speak to that mountain, it's got to move. Amen. Hebrews 10 and 32. For you have need of endurance, 
so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. you got to endure. God is telling us not to give up. Endure. Hold on. Out of millions of the generation that came out of Egypt, only two of that generation were able to go into the promised land. Why? Because they had faith and they had patience. And they are the only two of this number to go into that promised land leading that next generation. It's time for us to lead the next generation. It's time for you to lead. They need to see the witness of you. Of you. Matured saints of God. You. Not murmuring. Not blaming. Not complaining. Not whining. Not saying, oh, why? And asking all these questions. Why, 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 why? No, this is what God said. And I'm going to stand and I'm going to move and I'm going to follow the cloud by day and I'm going to follow His pillar of fire by night. Holy Ghost, you're going to lead me. I'm going to stand. I am not backing down. This is what you said, God, and I'm going to stand on it. I'm not going to whine and I'm not going to complain. I'm going to stand. And in this time of standing and being patient and enduring, I'm going to build a a habitation with you. I'm going to come to know you more. I'm going to trust you more. I'm going to worship you in the midst of my nights, in the midst of my days. I'm going to praise you when it doesn't look like it's praiseworthy even though I still yet know you are praiseworthy because you are my God. Hallelujah. So many miracles and so many promises of God have been aborted not for a lack of faith. I see more faith today than I saw when I started this church. I I, I feel encouraged because of the growth of faith in our congregation. So, so, so many promises of God are going to be aborted not because of a lack of faith, but because of a lack of patience. Because it didn't happen exactly when I thought it should happen. Folks stopping, holding on, lacking endurance. So let me close with this. First, uh, First Samuel 30 was a place where David, if you remember, it was one of the lowest days of David's life. He returned home after going out with his mighty men and and protecting the Israelites. He's still anointed to be king, but Saul is still king. And so he's staying in the sidelines and hiding from Saul. And Saul's army is trying to kill him. And and, uh, he's out doing, still trying to be a king without taking and usurping Saul's position and protecting the Israelites with his mighty men. And he returns home, and when he gets there, he finds that his children, his family, his possessions, and all the owns has uh, been destroyed, and uh, the possessions destroyed, but the enemy had taken his family away. And then the Bible says all the mighty men, their families were gone, and their possessions were destroyed as well, and they got bitter. They got upset, and they took up stones, and they're turning against their leader. They're turning against David, and they're going to stone him to death. And at his lowest point, David, that, I believe the lowest point in his life. And you know the story. He asked God, what should we do? And God says, pursue. And they pursue and they regain every, they get their families back. But at the lowest point in David's life, who would have ever known? This man who had been promised the kingdom. A man who had been promised the throne. A man that is about to die at the stoning of his own soldiers. I'm telling you, a wilderness experience. When you have people that you love turn against you, there's, that's more painful. People, I can't imagine that you fought on the battle lines with and you fought and, and, and helped them stay alive and they helped you stay alive and now they're turning on you. I can only imagine the pain that David was going through. But you'll go from 1 Samuel 30 to 1 Samuel 31, the very next chapter. It could have been the next day. It doesn't say. But in the very next chapter, across the wilderness on a hill is King Saul. And King Saul, which is greatest, uh, David's greatest uh, uh, test and his greatest hindrance, and that one that he had to endure because of Saul, right? He falls on his sword and he kills himself. Think about it. I don't know if it was the day before, or maybe a week before, but it was just very right before that. David had the lowest experience of his life. And the test was there to throw in the towel and give up. But he turned to God. He said, God, what should I do? And God said, get up. Get up, dry your tears, and 
pursue the enemy. I've anointed you. Let me tell you what, if David had given up on the lowest day of his life, the next day when Saul takes his life, David would not have been there to fulfill the promise. I say that because God has an urgency of what I'm saying tonight. There's somebody that's at some of the lowest place you've ever been in your life. And you feel like because this is the lowest place of giving up, the lowest place of letting go, the lowest place you feel like, I, I'm further now from the promise of God than I've ever been because of the low place. No, no. God is saying you're closer now to your breakthrough than you've ever been. Just hold on. Just hold on and don't give up. Hold on. The victory is yours. Hold on. Make a, make a worship decision in this dark time, in this day. Make a decision right now. God, I'm not going to turn my back on you. I'm coming to you. I'm going to build a habitation in the wilderness right now. I'm not going to give up in this trying experience right now. I'm going to build a tabernacle in this wilderness experience. I wish somebody that was here this evening would just say, you know what, I get it. I'm going to give God a crazy praise. Hallelujah. I, 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 it don't make no sense kind of praise. There's no reason for it kind of praise. You know, there's no reason I should hold on. There's no reason I should keep going. There's no reason I shouldn't throw this thing aside. But I'm going to praise my God anyway. It's a vision from heaven. And I'm going to hold on. Hallelujah. Ain't no snakes entered in. Ain't no destroyer welcomed in. I'm going to praise my God. I'm going to bless my God. I'm going to shout glory. Hallelujah. And hold on. Hold on. Hallelujah. Get this. You can stand with me. If you, don't, if you sit back down, I'll keep going. Okay, y'all got to stand. Y'all got to stand. <laughs> I hear you, princess. Hallelujah. When David went and got his family back, two of them, one was named Abigail, one was named Ahinahem. Abigail means his joy, and Ahinahem means his delight. He went and got his joy and his delight back. Don't you get, if he'd have given up, in that low time, he would have gone out without his joy and without his delight. Somebody needs to rise up in your spirit and say, I'm not going back. I'm not giving up. I'm holding on to the promise of God. I'm holding on to the plan of God. I've gone to, I'm going after my joy. I'm going after my delight. I'm not going to let my joy and delight tell me I need to go forward. I'm going to go forward and I'm going to get my joy and I'm going to get my delight back. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, hold on. Your joy is coming back. Your delight is coming back. Brighter days are coming, I say. Just hold on. Hold on. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we need faith and patience. And Lord God, I pray this maturing word of instruction that you've given this house tonight. We're going to take it. We're going to act on it. Not hearers only, but we're going to do it. We're going to act on it. And we're going to worship you and praise you. And we're going to lift you up. And we're going to declare the promises you've given us more now. With more clarity now. We're not going to be ashamed to repeat them. People say you stop repeating them because it's never going to happen. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. Lord, your promises are all yea and amen in Christ Jesus. And we're going forward. We're moving into it as mature sons and daughters of the Most High God. We're building a habitation right now in our dry time. We're building a place of praise right now. When we don't feel like praise, we're going to press on. We're going to press through. We're going to endure. We're not going to weary and well-doing. But we're going to reap. Hallelujah! Because we're not going to faint. Lord, we're going to hold on. And thank you, Lord. I thank you for every promise. I thank you for every provision. I thank you for every deliverance. I thank you, Lord God, for every entrance into every good thing that you have for every one of your sons and daughters. And Lord, if there's someone listening tonight that doesn't know you or know that they have a covenant with you, they can right now. You said everyone that calls on the name of Jesus shall be saved. You told Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Lord God, we know, we know there has to be the, a, a repentance. And Lord, there has to be a welcome mat where we say, Jesus, come into our heart and life and be our Lord and our Savior. Jesus, call on his name, Jesus. 
Paul said, if you will believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth that he is your Lord, meaning you've surrendered your life to him, you'll be saved. Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. God's got a plan for you. God has a purpose, a destiny of that which you were created. He will fill you with his spirit. He will fill you with his word. And he will give you instructions and show you how to walk into the way out of the bondages and out of the Egypts of life into the promised land. And from the instruction we received here tonight, we know what to do in that time between the promise and the promise fulfilled in that wilderness, in that challenge. We know how to continue. We're going to hold on to the promises of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. May God bless and prosper and protect and heal and deliver and show His love on each and every one of you. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you for coming out tonight. And may you enjoy a tremendous rest of the week.